but yeah shomo please continue thank you for your time again and uh, you can share the screen and start the discussion again and we are posting your recorded videos all the time in the youtube so those that that's making a playlist okay so right. um, i'm pretty sure that's going to help many people yeah so uh, in that case uh, since you won't be here i might be asking questions from time to time about the visibility audibility so somebody please answer yeah yeah gurnood are you there and orko i think can help and show modi yes sir yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 please help Great. okay all right Great. thank you guys uh, i i'll watch the recording thank you bye so let's start uh, uh, can you see my screen uh yeah but in a small um in it is in a, like a small um okay it's Let not me... going you can, can I pin it, it? Oh, okay i can pin it i guess yeah okay okay in that case i will do the enter screen let me see can you now see properly yes yes, yes yes okay so last time we talked about covid we gave the motivation of covariant uh, uh, introducing uh, connections of um, uh, on a riemannian manifold and the motivation was that we want to de define what is the what are the directional derivatives of vector fields we know for a function for a scalar valued function we can define the directional derivative by looking at how much the function what is the rate of change of function in that direction however for vector fields also we can define a certain a similar concept so you need to define for the vector field you can define the, di the directional derivative of the vector field y in the direction of v at the point p and then you can change this direction v to be a general vector field so you are now taking the derivative of a vector field with respect to another vector field so this this concept of differentiating on a manifold because now vector fields can also be defined on manifolds will take us to the next concept which is the concept of affine connections so we are going to give a very um, a uh, very uh, abstract definition however one can easily see that this is really like derivatives so let's just see so m okay sorry um, m be a smooth manifold you can see what i'm writing right right yes okay yes yes suppose gamma of tm is the space of vector fields on m basically uh, this gamma of tm it is denoted like that it is denoted like this because these are nothing but smooth sections of smooth global sections of the tangent bundle we talked about sections smooth sections tangent bundle so i hope uh, it's understandable now that's why it is denoted as gamma of tm otherwise you can just think of them as continuously or smoothly changing vectors on the manifold at each point you have a vector and as you change the points the vector fields changes smoothly so it is the space of smooth vector field um, uh, on of the manifold then an affine connection on m is a bilinear map bilinear means it's linear in every component from gamma tm cross gamma tm to gamma tm that takes x y to nabla xy 
which is basically just telling you that affine connection is nothing but derivative of a vector field with respect to another vector field. It takes two vector fields x and y and calculates the derivative of y with, in the direction of x, such that it must have some more properties. For all f in C infinity m, which means for all smooth functions on m, and all vector fields x, y on m, we must have the following properties. First one is delta x f times y. Now, which means that, uh, which means that uh, what is the derivative of f the function multiplied with the vector field. Now we already know from if you have done like calculus, in calculus we know the derivative of product has a particular kind of format. ddx of f times g is df dx g plus dg dx f. So something similar also happens for derivative of vector fields with respect to vector fields. So it would be the derivative of f in the direction of f, x, which is the co which is the directional derivative of f plus f times this. This is really the product rule. Uh, this is the directional derivative. And the second thing is, this is an interesting uh, property we need, that the derivative of y with respect to the vector field f times x, because if x is a vector field, f times x is also a vector field, right? Because when you multiply a vector by a scalar function, you basically just change the length of the vector and sometimes the orientation of the vector. But you keep it a vector only. So if you multiply a smooth function with a smooth vector field, it will remain as a smooth vector field. So in that case, this will become f times this. So basically, you see that there is this, in, this interesting kind of linearity with respect to the bottom component that any smooth function here can come out in front. So once you have these kind of properties, so uh, then the covariant derivative which obeys these properties, oh sorry, sorry, the kind of directional derivative that obeys these properties is called an affine connection. Also, this is often called the covariant derivative of y in direction of x. Now, this is about derivative of vector fields. Now, what about derivative of metric? We have talked about Riemannian metrics, right? So, what does Riemannian metric do? Riemannian metric takes two vector fields and gives you a number. So similarly, one now one can dif dif differentiate vector fields with the help of covariant derivatives. So similarly, one can actually extend this definition of covariant derivative for metrics. And let's see how. We will just give the definition. So covariant derivative on metric. So how do you do that? Suppose, okay, before you, before you define the, okay, okay, once, so once you can define covariant derivative on vector fields, you define the, that for a metric in the following way. So suppose, suppose is defined for vector fields and scalars. For scalars, the covariant derivative is simply nothing but the normal different, like differentiation, differential. I mean, differential has a different meaning, but let's not go into that. It's just differentiation. And then, however, suppose x, y, v are three vector fields. and g be a metric 
uh, Riemannian metric on our manifold M. Let's write Riemannian. Now the question is, first of all, why do we need three vector fields? Previously, we were seeing that for covariant derivative, we only need two vector fields, X and Y. We need three vector fields because there is also the Riemannian metric here. The Riemannian metric will take two vector fields into it. And then you would be differentiating that with respect to the third vector field X. And how do you define that? Definition is the covariant derivative of G, which takes three inputs now, which is sometimes written as del X G because you are now differentiating the metric with respect to the vector field X. And that takes the input Y V is same as, this is the definition, See, G of YZ is what? It's a function because a co metric takes two vectors and gives you a number. So it will take two vector fields and give you a function because the vector fields vary at every point. The number will also vary at every point, which gives us a function. Then we know that X can act on a function. Vector fields can act on a function, just directional derivatives. Then you have to subtract certain things. This is the definition. So um, this is the definition of uh, definition of uh, covariant derivative of a metric. It takes three vector fields. This delta G is called the covariant derivative of metric. And it takes three vector fields and the expression is like this. There is a motivation why this expression is like this, but let's not go into that. This is not the really the core of our topic. Uh, there are motivations for which that you will see that you might think the definition is too complicated. It's not really, it, it has motivation behind it. It really comes from the product rule. It should obey the product rule and that's why this definition come become like that. However, now we come to, after we define covariant derivative of metric, we come to the definition of levi civita connection. So what is a levi civita connection? An affine connection nabla is called a levi civita connection. If one nabla of G is zero, what does that mean? It means nabla of G is defined in this equation here. Let's call this equation one, i.e. one vanishes for all vector fields X, Y, Z. Okay. Second thing is. Second thing is, um, sorry, uh, just one second. Second thing is, nabla is torsion free, i.e., for vector fields x and y, we have delta x y minus delta y x is the Lie bracket of x and y. We actually saw what is this is this is x y minus y x and we saw what that is before. Now again there is a theorem every actually it's also true for pseudo Riemannian manifold but let's not focus on that. Every Riemannian manifold MG has a unique Levi Civita connection. We are not going to prove this. Okay. 
So now, previously we saw that every smooth manifold has a Riemannian structure. May not be unique though, but every Riemannian manifold has a levi simita connection, which is unique. To it, it comes inherently from the metric, in some sense. Now. I mean, we are not going into definition of a pseudo Riemannian manifold. That's really just think of it as Riemannian manifold for now. Now, now we come to one of the most important concepts. What is that? That is the concept of curvature. So before you give, before I give the, okay. So guys, I'm giving you an option. Do you want to see the formal definition of curvature before I give you the intuition or so that or do you want to see the intuition before seeing the formal definition? It's up to you. In Just in speak. Intuition. intuition. Okay, the intuition first. Great. Okay, so let's talk about the intuition of curvature is actually quite interesting. So suppose I'm drawing an arrow. What is this arrow? This arrow is a vector. So now then this we are drawing this arrow on R2, right? This is a plane on which I'm drawing. So this arrow is R2. So let's select that and let's let's make it travel in a loop and take it back here. You see that when I am making it travel in a loop, keeping it parallel to the surface and taking it back to its original position it superimposes with the previous one. So the suppose the original position is position one, and then we are again taking it in a loop like this, or in a loop like this. Then you see, as we come close to the original position, it exactly superimposes. Is it clear completely? Yes. Is it clear? Great. Yes. Now, Let's try to show you something. So in case, if it is possible, uh, uh, you should uh, make my screen uh, pinned so that you see me uh, in a bigger way. So suppose now I have a football or a basketball in my hand. Now look at this ball. This ball we know is a curved surface, right? So what do we mean? How do we measure curvature? So the idea is this. A measure of curvature can be done in the following way. So suppose, suppose I have a vector field here like this. And now previously, what did we do? We had a vector on the plane and we moved it in a small loop and brought it in, I mean, keeping it parallel to the plane and then brought it in the original position. And there we saw that the vector field is exactly superimposing with the from, from the vector that we started that we are starting with right now let's do the same exercise here so this was uh, for example this was our original position now okay let's put a pen here okay i don't know whether you can see me or not okay so this is a pen and now we are okay it's hard to see so suppose we are here and then we are going like this. Remember the position. If look at remember the position of the vector field. Now we are going down, then going like this, and then going up to the same original position. See, it started like this. And when I came back, it is like this. So which means, so if you look at it like this, so, so it started like this, it go went and then went and then came back here. It is almost doing a 90 degree angle with the previous one. So it started like this, it ended like this. So it means that, we, and why is this happening? We saw on a paper on the screen when we tried to draw a vector and moved it on a loop, we saw that it is exactly coming back to its original position and orientation. But now for a curved surface, when we are having a vector, take like this, then like this, and then take back like this, we see its orientation is completely changed. We were here, we were here like this. Now, when we come back, we are like this. So because of this, this is actually a measure of curvature. 
you take a vector or a vector field because you have to be, you have to define it in every point so you take a vector and move it in a small loop around a point and see how much the vector is differing from its original orientation and the difference of that will give you a measure of the curvature at that point now it is obviously not very um, uh, rigorous and let's try to give a rigorous definition of that before that is it okay like was the intuitive understanding clear for everyone was the uh, yes the trick that i did here was that completely fine with all of you yes great yes so uh, let's see so i am going to start start sharing again can you see my screen oh i don't think so one second uh can you see my screen no sir you can't now we are yeah not now i can yes okay so this this method of taking a vector field and then trans and then taking it parallelly to the surface throughout is this process of parallelly translating a vector field and is called parallel transport in the language of differential geometry however i don't think we need to go into the definition of parallel transport and then do stuff so basically uh so how do you define curvature so let's give the intuitive definition first then we will give the formal definition we all tried to give a intuitive understanding by moving a vector field on the ball and we saw that uh, we saw by pictures how what the intuition is let's start, try to give now an intuitive definition what is that intuitive definition suppose we are on a let's draw a curved surface okay and suppose we want to we have two vector fields x and y at the curved surface at a point p or rather let's just uh, draw two big vector fields suppose we have x and y two vector fields at a point p on the surface and you want to do the same exercise that we did so basically you have a vector field z and you want to make it travel through this through a loop around this point p how do you do that well you already have two vector fields so what you do you scale them which means you take some epsilon y which where epsilon is less than less than one you scale it and also scale it to epsilon x so that the resulting rectangle that you get by completing these two sides parallelly is almost on the surface so this kind of approximation is always done in differential geometry or in differential calculus. So in this kind of, suppose you are scaling the vector fields X and Y so that they are very close to the point P and almost on the surface. There, you take the vector field V and make it travel parallelly through this rectangle. That would This rectangle would be your loop. And once you do that, actually it won't be looking like this, it will be looking like it's somewhat like this and then when you go back it will become something like this so once you go back to the original position as we saw for the ball it will make an angle or a, in the in other words if the original position was like this when you get back it would be something like this so if x and y are tangents P, tangent vectors by tangent I mean tangent vectors and z is a this is your z v is a tangent vector also at p then let's call this vf which is the final orientation of z after you make it traverse through this small rectangle of lengths epsilon x and epsilon y then 
vf minus z can be expressed as a quantity r x y v times epsilon square so the difference between vf and z would be of order epsilon square where epsilon is very small number and the diff and multiplied with the quantity this quantity is called the the curvature basically the riemann curvature tensor you don't have to worry about what a tensor is tensor is just like a higher dimensional vector higher not higher dimensional like higher rank vector in some sense so now this is the intuitive definition is that clear so again if you look at the ball i am having the ball in my hand you take a vector field start like this then go go come back and the difference of the original position like this and the final position would be a measure of curvature exactly in the way that we have dictated here is that clear everyone yes great so now let us give the formal definition what is the formal definition the formal definition is x y z b vector fields on a riemannian manifold m with metric g and levi civita connection which we defined nabla then we can define the then r x y z which came from the intuition here is nabla x nabla y z minus nabla y nabla x z because see nabla y z is a vector field because affine connection takes two vector fields y and z to another vector field nabla y z now once you it's a vector field you can again take its affine connection because vector field can we can always take derivatives of them so what this is a vector field so you can take its affine connection with respect to x now so now do you take this minus this minus nabla x y v now commuter of x and y is also a vector field so you can take derivative of z with respect to it now you might again think that oh my god this looks very difficult it's not if you unfurl the definition for example take your manifold to be rn with the euclidean metric you will see it exactly does the job of moving the vector field z in the rectangles formed by epsilon x and epsilon y it exactly does that job this exactly calculates the difference anyways so this r is called the riemann curvature tensor and uh, now once you have a tensor like this a riemann curvature tensor you can think of it as a higher rank matrix because what does a matrix do if you think about a matrix this is a matrix right suppose it's a 2 cross 2 matrix let's make it simple it's a 2 cross 2 matrix like this so what do you what can you do with this you can multiply it with a vector which is a column vector then what will you get by multiplying a matrix with a column vector you will get a column vector but then you can write multiply on the left with a row vector and now if you do this entire computation you will get a scalar right that is true in fact not for 2 cross 2 but for any matrix any square matrix or in fact any matrix you can multiply it with a column vector and multiply with a row vector to get a scalar well so matrix basically you can think of a matrix as taking these two vectors as input and giving you a scalar as output so exactly in the same way you can think of this curvature tensor as a higher rank matrix in which takes three vectors x y z instead of two as input and gives you an output as a vector field i mean not a vector field if you not exactly a vector field if you feed z then it's just a vector yeah so the point is that well it's a vector field if you don't evaluate it at a point but yeah 
so it's a vector field basically uh you feed it three vectors into it and it gives you a vector field so basically it's like a higher rank matrix which takes more vectors than an ordinary matrix and gives you something so matrices can be you can take trace of a matrix right what is trace trace is nothing but the sum of the diagonal elements of a matrix in the same way you can take trace of these higher rank matrices which are called tensors so the trace of r is called the ricci curvature the demand the trace of the demand curvature tensor is called the ricci curvature often denoted like ric ricci so Ricci was a mathematician. Its name are named after him, just like Riemann. And uh, the thing is, why do we take this trace? Because sometimes for some systems, Ricci curvature is dealing with Riemann curvature tensor is difficult. If you think about it, why is it difficult? Because it takes three vector fields as inputs. Keeping track of all the vector fields all the time, three vector fields, is difficult. But Ricci curvature only takes two vector fields and as inputs how well the idea is not that difficult why because a matrix if you think again go back let's go back to the matrix analogy in matrix you will see a matrix takes two vector inputs however if you take the trace of a matrix it's a scalar already it doesn't take any vector input so once you take the trace of something it loses its ability to take inputs so once you take trace of the riemann curvature tensor it takes less number of inputs just like for matrices so now uh, so how do you do that well how do you calculate that well uh, suppose how do you calculate ricci curvature Suppose V1 up to Vn be a basis of Tpm, which is the tangent space of M at P. Then Ricci curvature at the point P, which only takes two vector fields as inputs, suppose let us call them Y and Z, will be very simple. It will be from I from 1 to N. rp vi okay rp vi what is rp r is the riemann curvature tensor at the point p now riemann curvature tensor takes three vectors as inputs what are those three vectors vi y v now you take the metric inner product of this with respect to vi and then sum it from i equal to 1 to n this is this is really what trace is also i mean i'm not going into the details of linear algebra right now this is really trace so this is what trace is and uh, then you can calculate the ricci curvature at the point p with respect to the riemann curvature and the metric and everything is it clear the formal definition doesn't need to be cleared just know that there is something like ricci curvature which has the following intuition is that clear again Yes, sir. anyone? Yes, sir. I, I have a small question. Um, yeah. So you, you wrote that. So in the in the definition of Ricci curvature, you have a G of RP of VI comma Y. So I, I was wondering, uh, it, it, so instead of VI, I was expecting a vector field instead of just one vector there because RP is defined on um, on vector fields uh, rather than on vectors? Uh, no, uh, for when you define RP, you just evaluate everything on P. See, Ricci curvature is defined only at a, only from point to point. So uh -huh. when you are curvature for a surface, you can only define, I mean, curvature has a specific value at a point. Right, right. If, uh -huh. you, if you talk, if you do not do it at the point P, 
then you have to talk about curvature tensor which is which is a, which is a, it's a different kind of thing in that case you have to look at a global orthonormal frame of the tangent bundle and then that becomes you can then do it the way that you are saying in that case uh, you cannot define you can define it for point to point but you also have a global definition where you do not take basis of the tangent space at a particular point but you take a global basis of the entire tangent bundle and the basis would be basis of vector fields and then you can do the exact same thing but normally right. when you define curvature it's more sensible mm -hmm. to talk from point to point okay. because every point can have different like curve curvature although your yeah. point is right that you can define it for vector field so you can have a curvature field in some sense like which varies from point to point because curvature varies from point to point for general surfaces. However, in that case, you need a global orthonormal frame for the tangent model. Okay. 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 Yeah. Thanks. So now let's now again again for the for some clarification. This is the picture. This you can find this on you. I think Wikipedia. So again, you start with the vector field pointing left. Then you go down on this path, transporting it parallelly, and you do not come back to its original orientation. Uh, so um, this is really what I wanted to show with the ball. And now uh, this is there is this amazing playlist on YouTube, which is by Frederick Schuller, Lectures on Geometric Anatomy of Theoretical Physics. You should definitely watch it if you really want to pursue a career in differential geometry. It's one of the best lectures out there. Oshanida was talking about it two days, two weeks back. It's a really the, one of the places from where I learned a lot of things. I still have to watch the playlist completely. It's a beautiful playlist. Now, once you have the Ricci curvature, again, Ricci curvature takes two vector fields as inputs, just like a matrix. Matrix takes two vectors, it takes two vector fields. So you can again take trace of this. So the trace of the Ricci curvature with respect to the metric uh, is called the scalar curvature. Again, all these curvatures like scalar curvature, Ricci curvature, curvature tensor, they are just measures of different types, like not different types. Riemann curvature tensor is really the most general, but often dealing with Riemann curvature tensor becomes difficult. So we talk about Ricci curvature. Often dealing with Ricci curvature tensor is also difficult or in fact not needed. In that case, scalar curvature suffices. It's just a scalar. And so now you might think, what is this trace with respect to G? This is nothing. This is really, so in local coordinates, think of it like this. In local coordinates, what is this Ricci, Ricci curvature? This Ricci curvature is actually a matrix in local coordinates. Why? Because it takes two vector fields, exactly like a matrix does. You can think of this as your vector y, and this as the vector z, and this as the Ricci curvature. It takes two vector fields and it gives you a scalar. So exactly like that. So basically, Ricci curvature in local coordinates is just like a matrix. Now, we also know that the metric tensor in local coordinate also is like a matrix. So how do you calculate this S? You just take this. This is S. What do you mean by this? So if Gij is metric in local coordinate, then Gij is inverse of Gij. So once you have the inverse of this matrix, you multiply these two matrices together like this with the appropriate uh, uh, with the appropriate uh, indices, and then you get it. Okay. Uh, again, we have the yeah. Okay. Which means this is sum over i n j g i j s. This okay. Okay. Now we are kind of done with. Uh, we are kind of done with uh, 
the theory that I wanted to talk about. Is there any question from anywhere? Now I will go back to slides. Any question? Sir, could you talk about the Levi Sivata con uh, connection? Like uh, the, f the first part of that. Okay. Uh, okay. It's Levi Civita, first of all. And uh, an affine connection is called Levi Civita if this expression. So Nabla is our affine connection. It is called Levi Civita connection if it obeys two properties. First of them is this expression here, this entire expression vanishes for every value of x, y, and z, for every vector field of x, every vector field x, y, and z. And it is torsion free, which means if you have two vector fields x and y, then the difference between nabla x, y, and nabla y, x is this, this vector field. Okay. Sir, could you define torsion? Oh, no. It is, uh, let's not go into this. Torsion has a definition. But just know that torsion free means this. This is torsion free. Okay. So if the if this is not obeyed, then it is called torsion. Torsion free basically means uh it's hard to define, it's hard to give intuition for this, at least for me. So torsion free basically means how should I say this? It basically means that if you take the derivative of y with respect to x and sub take the difference of nabla x y and nabla y x, they behave exact. The difference between that is exactly something natural. By something natural, I mean the right hand side. The right hand side is exactly x y minus y x. So basically, you first you have a function f, you put y on it, then you put x on it and then subtract it from yx of the same function. This is something that we naturally understand. We don't have to go to any connection, anything. We just need vector fields. We don't even know, we don't even need a Riemannian structure for it. We can define the right hand side very naturally. So for any smooth function, this right hand side is well defined once you have a smooth vector field. So it's something natural. If the left-hand side also gives you that, then it means it doesn't have any torsion, which means once you act it on a function, or maybe if you think of it as vector field at a point, then xy minus yx is something natural, which is suppose pointing like this. When you are doing the left-hand side, it is not doing anything unnatural. It is not distorting this to make something else. This is what torsion basically means. This is what I know of torsion. Torsion basically means that x, y minus y, f, which is a naturally defined object, is same as nabla x, y minus nabla y, x, which is something complicated. levi civita connection is not something easy. So nabla x, y minus nabla y, x is something complicated coming from Riemannian structure. I mean, we, you need a Riemannian structure for defining these kind of things. And then that is exactly acting as we want it to act like. OK? Yes. OK, any more questions before we go to the slides? Till now, we haven't talked about almost any complex analysis, really. I mean, um, we really just talk. This is just real differential geometry. So let's just talk about some complex thing ever. So now, can you see my slides? Is it yes. okay? Okay. Yes. So. Yes. Okay. So before going to the slides, let's recall that we have these two uh, interesting objects in CN, which are the generalization of unit ball or unit disk in the complex plane. Uh, you define the norm of a complex vector Z like this, which is like basically the L2 norm of all the vector of the all the components. And then you can define Bn, which is the norm of z less than 1, 
V in CN, or this poly disc, which is basically product of discs in complex plane. Basically, each component is in a unit disc of complex plane, and you take product of them. We saw that they are not biholomorphically equivalent, which gives us this new field of mathematics called several complex variables. So then we also need to know this kind about these kind of domains called pseudo-convex domains. Now, this ball has an interesting property. We know, let's let's go back for a bit to our uh, you can see my screen where I'm writing, right? Yes. Okay. So see this ball, if you look at a ball, a ball is convex, right? You know what a convex set is, I suppose. A convex set means that if you, oh, none of them are like, okay. So suppose you have a set, it's called convex. If you take any two points in it and you join them by a line, the line is completely contained within the set, right? So now you see the ball is a convex set. And this convexity is actually not something to, is sometimes we, um, if you are preparing for JE, I'm sure you talk about concave upwards, concave downwards functions and so on. So there also you see how important convexity is. So convexity is something really important for complex analysis. Why? Because there are certain kinds of convexity which are biholomorphic invariant. So if you, for example, have a biholomorphic map, again, what is biholomorphic? It is a complex differentiable map from whose inverse is also different, complex differentiable. So suppose you have a biholomorphic map from this to this, like from a domain omega to a domain G, both are in CN, then you have a certain kind of convexity on omega, which is biholomorphic invariant, which means if omega is biholomorphic invariant, then G is biholomorphic. In, then, sorry, if omega is that, that kind of convex, then G is also that kind of convex. Or in other words, if G is also that kind of convex, then omega is this kind of convex, because F also has an inverse, which is holomorphic. So then, this kind of this special kind of convexity is a biholomorphic invariant, and we in complex analysis are very much interested to talk about biholomorphic invariant objects. So we definitely get interested towards these kind of convexities. So this is called pseudo convexity. Why is it called pseudo? Well, it's not entirely clear to me because it's more general than convexity. It's more general. Pseudo convexity basically means that suppose. Uh, pseudo convexity actually is defined on the boundary of a domain. See, the boundary of a convex set, like for example, take this ball kind of domain omega, it looks like this kind of a fluffy object, right? So that is the thing. So pseudo, uh, basically a domain is called pseudo convex if locally near the, so on. if you suppose this is our domain omega, it is pseudo convex if P is a point on a boundary and around this point locally, the boundary is kind of like the boundary of a unit ball, which is like fluffy, like stretching up, stretching up outwards. This kind of a surface is there. If this happens around the point P, then point P is called a pseudo, pseudo convex or strictly pseudo convex point. If this happens at all points on the boundary, then the whole domain omega is called strictly pseudo convex or pseudo convex. Anyways, so these kind of convexity notions are important. Another notion we should know before looking into the definition of pseudo convexity, that is the definition of a defining function. What is a defining function? Well, defining function is something like this. It's something that you use all the time without calling it in this name. Uh, okay, this is a question to all the JE, uh, like if, sorry, not the JE, but uh, all the high school students who are present here, if any. Suppose this is the unit ball in R2, x, y, 
and this is x square plus y square unit. This is the unit circle. How do you write the region inside the unit circle? Anyone? Sir, x square plus y square is less than 1. Less than 1, right? So let's now complex plane is also like R2, right? So if V equal to S plus IY, then what is S square plus I square? This is just mod V square, right? This minus 1 is less than 0, right? This is the equation of the unit disk in complex plane, right? This is called the defining function for the unit disk. Why? Because the set rows is equal to 0 defines boundary of the unit disk, if you call this the unit disk. So if you have a domain whose boundary is exactly defined by vanishing of a function, and inside the domain, you have the function to be either less than 0 or greater than 0, doesn't matter, you just multiply with a minus sign, then that function is called the defining function of the domain. This is something that we know from co coordinate geometry, but uh, we just didn't call it in that name. In complex analysis, this name is very important. Why? Let's go into that. Is it clear, the defining function concept? It's not too difficult, right? Is it clear? Yes. Yes, sir. OK. So now let's talk about kilo convex domain. Suppose you have a domain in CN. You can see my slides, right? Yes. 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 So suppose we have a domain in CN where rho is a C2, which means twice continuously differentiable uh, defining function in a neighborhood of omega bar. Don't forget about them. Rho is just a defining function of omega. Then omega is called pseudo convex at every if. For every point P on the boundary of omega, this condition is satisfied. Now, this condition might look like a mouthful, but just think of as the think of a think of the picture that we drew. It basically this condition means that locally it looks like a convex set around the point P. Now, if this inequality is strict here, it's called strictly pseudo-convex, which is exactly like a ball. If it is not strict, it basically means pseudo-convex, which means what? Well, you know the concept of a saddle point, right? Where basically you have like, uh, okay, let's just draw. So suppose, for example, you have something like this. So here you see that it is curved in one direction. But in this, at the top point, if you go in this horizontal direction, it's flat. So it basically means the same thing. If it is not strictly pseudo-convex and just pseudo-convex, it means that it there are certain directions in which it is convex, but there are certain directions in which it is flat. It is not like the ball. A ball is convex in every direction, right? This ball here, is, if you look at a point, it convex in this direction, convex in this direction. So that is great. But if you have some sort of a saddle, then you, it will be a flat in one direction. And it won't be strictly pseudo-convex. For strictly pseudo-convex, it is convex in every direction. What are some examples? The ball is a strictly pseudo-convex domain with defining function this, just like we had for one-dimensional complex analysis. Now you have multiple coordinates. However, the poly disk is not a strictly pseudo-convex domain. One can prove it. I'm not going to the proof. It's very easy. The proof is very easy. Now, if you have this kind of a domain, for example, the next domain, omega, that is actually not strictly pseudo-convex at this point where z2 equal to 0. Why? Because I am giving an intuitive idea because of this power 4. Because of this power 4, there will be flat direction. It is not like the ball, right? If you had ball, then it would have power 2 here. But if it's not power 4, if it's not power 2, then basically you see that if you take two derivatives of that, if you, it will still vanish at z2 equal to 0. If you take two derivatives of z2 square and then you put z2 equal to 0, it won't vanish. But for 0 to the power 4, it will happen. It is a very intuitive idea. This is the, this is the reason for which 
it is not strictly pseudo convex at the point z2 equal to 0. At the points, where is it equal to 0? Now, we saw that Riemann mapping theorem, again, just recall, Riemann mapping theorem was this, that if you have a simply connected domain in complex plane, just one complex variable, if you have a simply connected region, which is not the complex plane, then you can find a biholomorphic map to that to the unit ball in complex plane, not in CN. We want to find generalization of such theorems in higher dimensions because this theorem clearly fails. But then, this is one of those generalizations. This is a theorem of Ban Wong, who is, I think, a professor at UC Irvine or Riverside right now. And this is a great theorem that is one of the first of its kind to find a biholomorphism from unit ball to a domain, just like Riemann mapping theorem. So the following statements are equivalent. So if G is a strongly or strictly pseudo convex domain in CN, then G, then if one of them, one of these statements is true, then all the others are true. So you see, G is biholomorphic to the unit ball is equivalent to any of these three statements. So if you can show that G obeys any of these strict three statements, then you can say G is biholomorphic to unit ball which is really like Riemann mapping theorem. In Riemann mapping theorem says if you have a G which is simply connected, which is not the whole complex plane, so basically if G is satisfying certain properties, then it is a unit ball. The same thing is here. Although the conditions are more complicated because Riemann mapping theorem fails in higher dimension. Again, a domain is called homogeneous if its automorphism group acts transitively on it, which means if you have a domain, its automorphism group are the group of our biholomorphic transformation from the domain to itself. So automorphism group acts transitively means for any two points on the domain, P and Q, you can find an automorphism that can take P to Q. Such things happen for unit ball. Their automorphism, in for unit ball, the automorphism group is something called Mobius transformation. And Mobius transformations always take from domain to domain. Like from, sorry, it's, sorry. It always is acts transitively. So now, what is Cheng's conjecture, which is something that we worked on? We will come to that. Before that, you also might ask that why did I define all this curvature and everything? Because now we are going to go to Einstein's equation very soon. Einstein's equations are the equations for general relativity. And those equations will become somewhat relevant for Cheng's conjecture. So today, I think this would be it. After uh, the next time, we would talk, talk about these kind of exact topics that we need for my research. Uh, was that clear, everyone? OK. Was it clear? Arko, was it clear? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I was going to ask you one question. Maybe you mentioned so the, this poly disk was that an example of pseudo convex domain or it is not? It is pseudo convex, um, but not strictly pseudo convex. Oh, it is a pseudo convex, but it's not strictly. In fact, no, let me just think. Uh, uh, yeah, it is pseudo convex, but not strictly pseudo convex. Yeah, it is pseudo convex. Yeah. See. If you take a boundary point of a poly disk, yeah. Uh, uh, what is the boundary point of a poly disk? A poly disk is basically product of many disks, right? So, a boundary point of a poly disk is basically boundary of, one of at least one of those disks that you are taking product of. Right. So right. here you can think of the defining function as just the defining function of a disk in complex plane. And there you will see that because it's, def it's a defining function that only involves one variable, there are other directions where it, the Levy form, like mean, the defining function can become zero. It only involves one variable. So that's right. why it is, there are directions where it is flat. There is one I direction see. where it is convex, but that is just one variable. Mm -hmm. So that's why it is pseudo convex, but not strictly pseudo convex. And, and the theorem you just mentioned, it was for 
Okay. In the theorem, it is mentioned that uh, uh, okay. In the theorem, it is mentioned that G B a strongly pseudo-convex bounded domain. Strongly pseudo-convex is same as strictly pseudo-convex. They are just uh -huh. different names. So G yeah. has to be a strongly pseudo-convex domain. Otherwise, I mean, see, if G is not strongly pseudo-convex, it cannot be bihomomorphic unit ball in the first place. Because as I said, strictly pseudo-convexity is something biholomorphic invariant. So if the unit ball uh -huh. is strictly pseudo-convex, something that is biholomorphic to it has to be strictly pseudo-convex. Yeah. So you have okay. to start with that. Uh -huh. So yeah. And the statement that uh, that polydisc is not uh, uh, bi uh, biholomorphic to uh, the actual uh, disc, yeah, unit ball. Is it is it hard or is it easy to? The uh, proof. The proof is very easy. I, in fact, I in fact I proved it uh, in the first. Oh, in the very first. Okay, yeah, I'll see. I will see then. The, basically, the, the proof. Okay. Basically, Ashunida also mentioned. Basically, the way it is done, it was done by Poincaré. And uh -huh, okay, so I see. What he did is basically you look at the automorphism groups of polydisc and the unit ball, and they are uh -huh. not isomorphic. Okay, okay. If you I have see. two domains which are biholomorphic to each other, their automorphisms must must be isomorphic right, because they go right. from one to the other. Right, right. If you don't have because you do not have the automorphism groups to be isomorphic, you can directly say that they are not biholomorphic. Automorphism group of the unit ball is the Mo generalized Mobius transformations. And for the polydisc, it's nothing but the product of Mobius transformation of each of the unit disk in complex plane. Let's and see. of course, you can permute them, but yeah, that's it. So they are two different objects altogether. Yeah, the proof is very simple. There are, in fact, stronger results. The result, there are results that says that. There cannot be any biholomorphic map to from the unit disk. I mean, it's not very strong. I mean, there cannot be any biholomorphic map from the poly disk to the any strict uh, any strictly pseudo-convex domain because obviously strictly pseudo-convex domains are biholomorphic in there, so, so uh, you cannot have anything. So unit ball is just one of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Yeah, yeah, this kind of geometrical. I mean, the good thing about several complex variable is like, see, I'm going to talk about something about several complex variable, but I had to give so much of like background. That's yeah, the yeah, the subject. Yeah, right? the, yeah, the differential geometry side is, is, yeah, it's always you have to get through all these definitions. Yeah, but yeah, you, you, you did a great job. I, I also. Saw those those stuff back in like in my graduate school. So yeah, it was a nice uh, thing to look back at. Yeah, you, you did a great job. I, I hope everybody uh, yeah, learned something from here. I also hope so. But uh, uh, I hope I am learnable. But <laughs> yeah, no, it's 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 great. So yeah, so somehow the curvature will come into play in the in yeah. The next Einstein's, Einstein's equation deals with Ricci. So there. Okay. You go. Okay. Einstein's equation deals with Ricci curvature. So, uh, yeah, so that, that there you go. I mean, that's why I had to define Ricci curvature, actually. Uh -huh. Okay. Otherwise, people will just look at Einstein's equation. Einstein's equation is not an easy thing to look at. And you will just think, in fact, I when I will talk about Einstein's equation, I will also try to tell what it means. Like, and okay. ambiguity is not very easy, right? So, I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, oh. So, that's why I have to, I had to give some sort of physical intuition of curvature before we go into Einstein's equation. Yeah, guys, by the way, just so you know, so in case there are any high school students who want to flaunt their knowledge of general relativity to their classmates, uh, it's coming next week, most likely. Yeah. Yeah. So anyways, guys, it was great. I think we might need one more. Uh, we probably, I hope we would be done in one week. Let's see. Uh, uh, otherwise, yeah. I can do two weeks at most after this, but I hope we will be done in one week. After that, we can do a question answer session or something like that. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Great. Great. Okay. Thank you. Any other question, Gunur? No, sir. 
ओके 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 सी यू गाइस ओके हैव अ नाइस वीक थैंक यू सर